Well, it's great to see you this afternoon. If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to work through, Lord willing, Ephesians 5, 18 through 6, 9. This section is pretty easy to structure. There are instructions for husbands and wives, 518 through uh, verse 33, chapter 5, verse 18 through 33, instructions for husbands and wives, then 6, 1 through 4, parents and children, and then 6, 5 through 9, masters and slaves. All of these instructions are to be carried out by those who are filled with the Spirit. So again, these instructions can't be done in our own strength. They're all consequences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought I'd read a quote from G.K. Chesterton as we start by thinking about marriage. G.K. Chesterton, that great British journalist and author, has this to say about marriage and about this, he wrote this many years ago, a marriage and divorce in America. He was a Britisher. He says, if Americans can be divorced for incompatibility of temper, I cannot conceive why they are not all divorced. <clears throat> I've known many happy marriages, but never a compatible one. The whole aim of marriage is to fight through and survive the instant when incompatibility becomes unquestionable. For a man and woman as such are incompatible. So, I was also listening to a song lately, and the songwriter captures the thoughts of those who leave a husband and wife for a new relationship and divorce their spouse. By the way, this is not a Christian a songwriter. This is what he said. He says, people meet somebody new, and they leave the rest behind. We can have it all even though our lives are short. The kids, they'll get used to it. It happens all the time. And then the writer adds, no one is even surprised anymore. And that's true, isn't it? But actually, we do know, before we look at the text, the kids don't get used to it, do they? Judith Wallerstein's work, if you're familiar with it, on divorce shows that there are negative consequences in the lives of children of divorce. Now, I want to say, if you're divorced, God can forgive, right? God forgives. God grants a new start. But we also need to realize how horrible divorce is and its serious consequences. I, I've just seen it up close and personal. Our third son, when he married his, his wife, uh, in 2011, that very year, her parents went through a divorce. She's, a, she's an adult now, but I just saw her, the pain she experienced seeing her parents split apart. Even as an adult child, it, was, it, it just really rocked her and, and is still difficult to, for her to this day. Well, let's, uh, let's read the word of the Lord and we'll read first about husbands and wives in 522 through <clears throat> 533. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. <clears throat> Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
nowadays, uh, and, and Bruce Ware referenced this, nowadays this is a rather alien wor word to people in our culture, especially the part about husbands, uh, I mean wives submitting to the husbands and, and husbands being the head of the wife. And so the question that's asked, even by Christians, is, is this passage cultural? That is, when, when Paul says husbands should, uh, wives should submit to their husbands, is that a word that transcends the culture of the first century and still applies today in the 21st century? So, because some are arguing that it doesn't, that that, that word is, is culturally limited and doesn't apply in the same way today. I would argue that it is not cultural for uh, several reasons. First of all, marriage, marriage is a relationship that God enshrined at creation. Marriage is a creation relationship. Perhaps you know, some argue that this passage is cultural because in chapter six, verses five through nine, a passage we're coming to, we have a pa passage about masters and slaves. So do, do we believe that is a transcendent word of God in the sense that God endorses and commands slavery? So p people put these two passages together as you are, are, are probably aware, and they say just as God does not endorse or commend slavery, nor does he endorse or commend wives submitting to their husbands. Those are both culturally limited. Uh, what is our response to that? I, I knew a, a conservative friend of mine who was in a debate about this, and, and the person said to him, if you believe husbands, I mean wives should submit to their husbands, then you also believe in slavery. And his response was, I guess I believe in slavery. That's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> I think he gave the game away right there. What's the difference between, we're going to look at the slavery passage later, but I can say these things now. What's the difference between these two passages? What I already mentioned, marriage was instituted by God at creation. Slavery was not. Slavery is an evil human institution that is regulated by the scriptures. Marriage is a divine institution ordained by God at creation, so they are remarkably different. Nowhere does Scripture ever command slavery. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, what does Paul say to slaves? If you can get your freedom, do so. Nowhere does he ever say to wives, if you can be free from submitting to your husbands, do so. Right? The parallel doesn't stand. Do I, let me just say another word since I'm on this matter regarding slavery. Why, why didn't Paul and other New Testament writers advocate the abolition of slavery in, in, in concrete and clear terms? That, that's a complex question that is not easy to answer, but I, but I think we can, I can say a couple things about that. And, and, and one of the things we can say is this. Remember the Christian movement was extremely small. It would be analogous to Christians in Japan lobbying strongly for the abolition of abortion. But Christians in Japan, as, as you probably know, they're a very small movement. They're not going to have that kind of societal impact given their small numbers. So that's one thing we can say. Secondly, I think we could say this, what, slavery, the, the American experiment with slavery, which is clearly evil, the American experiment with slavery, slavery is different from slavery in the Greco-Roman world. I, I'm not commending what they did in the Greco-Roman world. I don't think it was a good thing, but it wasn't race-based either. Was, most slaves were taken by wars, or some people even sold themselves into slavery. You, you became a slave in various ways. It wasn't as if one race of people were slaves, so it was, it was different in that regard as well. But, but here's, here's the point I'm trying to make. The early Christians, the early Christians didn't have an agenda by which to transform society economically. 
I'll put it a little bit more simply and straightforwardly. What, were, what would all these slaves do if they were released from their slavery? How would they live financially? It wasn't, it wasn't a capitalist society as if there were a lot of other jobs that people could take. So pragmatically speaking, what was the alternative? It took time to work things out. Many of the slaves would have been very upset to lose their position because there would be nothing else for them to do and no way to survive economically. So I think that's an important point to consider. Thirdly, per perhaps most important, the church fundamentally, Paul's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is not about societal revolution. The, the, the fundamental purpose of the church is not to transform a society politically. That is a very fine consequence if it, if it occurs, but that's not the fundamental call of the gospel, is to transform political systems. Instead, the, the way the gospel works, it transforms people from the inside and then political systems are influenced. Really, that's another way of saying what I said reg regarding Japan. If you want to change abortion in Japan, you've got to get enough people who think it's wrong, first of all. So the, but the gospel is not fundamentally about political transformation. So just, you know, that just saves me time later. So here's our first point, right? Marriage, marriage is different from uh, slavery because it was ordained by God as a good gift and it, and it came about because of the creation it's not a result of the fall in any way. So it is, it is good. Secondly, more particularly, when Paul calls upon wives to submit to their husbands, notice that he says in verse 22, they're to do so as to the Lord. And, he's, and then in verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. The, the comparison that is used indicates that we don't have a cultural reality being expressed here, right? As the church submits to Christ, so wives submit to their husbands. There's, there's not a hint there that this is culturally limited. In, instead, it is most natural to take it as a transcendent word. Third and finally, Paul ends the passage by quoting Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, which I think is incidentally the definition of marriage, where you have leaving, cleaving, and one flesh. You don't have marriage unless you have all three of those, right? Those people, I'm, those people who say you're married, if you just have a sexual relationship, that's wrong, right? Marriage is leaving, cleaving, and one flesh, all three elements. For there to be marriage, Genesis 2.24, Paul says in verse 32, this mystery of the relationship between a husband and wife, this mystery in the Bible, a mystery is typically something that was previously concealed but is now revealed. This mystery, this secret that wasn't known to others is profound. And, and, and we could say, oh, yes, the mystery of marriage is a profound thing, isn't it? The mystery of how a man relates to a woman, marriage. But Paul goes on to say, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So this is a very important point that the marriage relationship mirrors, reflects Christ's relationship to the church, not vice versa. It isn't as if, First came marriage, and then God said, well, that's a good illustration then of I, when Christ and the church come along, that's going to reflect marriage. It's the opposite, right? Marriage mirrors Christ's relationship to the church. But that says this is not a cultural word, that wives submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Every marriage is to mirror that relationship, and of course, the other side of it, husbands being the head of their wives. So I think we have strong, compelling arguments to say that we don't have a cultural word here, but a transcendent word that still applies to today. So what, what are the instructions? 
first of all, for wives. Wives are called upon to submit to their own husbands, to, to subject themselves to their husbands. That's what the word means, to, to, to order yourself under your husband, to be subordinate. Now, those are very alien words to our culture. Maybe you feel that a little bit even as I talk. Maybe for some of you, there's a little bit of bristling going on, perhaps. But we have to say immediately, don't we, that, that such submission, such subordination, subjecting yourself, what he's talking about here, has nothing to do with inferiority. We all understand that? That, that men and women are equally made in the image of God. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, men, men and women uh, uh, have equal access to salvation, Galatians 3.28. Uh, men and women have an equal destiny. They're co-heirs of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3, 7. So he's not speaking of an ontological, essential inferiority, is he? Men and women are, are essentially, substantially, I'm using a lot of big words, ontologically, right? That helped, didn't it? Um, <laughs> the, the same, right? We're fundamentally the same. Both made in the image of God. And, and we receive great help, don't we, from 1 Corinthians 15 and really other passages of Scripture, uh, which some of them Bruce Ware mentioned. The father, the father sends and the son goes. The son obeys. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the son subjects himself to the father. The son submits to the father. The son subordinates himself to the father. But the son is equal essentially to the Father, isn't he? He has a different role, a different function. But that different function and different role does not signal inferiority, essentially. They're, they're both equally God. So a different role, right? The world, the world tells us, well, a different role, and especially a subordinate role, means you're inferior. But that's not biblical, right? That's not a scriptural worldview. I, w I was on a debate um, in the, uh, in, in the, uh, on this matter one time years ago, and I was debating this matter of men and women and husbands and wives, and I made this very point, and I, and I applied it to the president of my university, and I said, I, 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 he's my boss. I'm subordinate to him, but I'm not inferior to him. And the other person on the panel said, yes, you are. That's what they said. You're inferior to him because he's the boss. And I said, that, that is an entirely secular worldview. I completely reject that. That somehow the person with more authority is of more significance and value and worth? That's completely unbiblical. I mean, it's shocking that someone would say that in, in, in that context, claiming to uh, follow the scriptures and saying such a thing. Notice, notice that the call to submission, let's just hear it in its starkness, is comprehensive. Wives should submit in everything to their husbands as long as they agree. In most things. On Saturdays. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says in everything. I just want to announce to everyone here, I didn't write this. Right? This is the Word of God. This is what God says. This is God's Word. R notice that she submits as to the Lord in relationship to God. I, I don't think it's right to think of it as a chain of command, as some have explained it, as if somehow the, it, God works through the husband, then gets to the wife. No, the wife relates directly to God and submits to Him. You submit as to the Lord. You don't submit because your husband is so wise. Because husbands aren't always wise. You don't submit to him because he's so intelligent. You may be smarter than he is. You submit to him because God has ordained that he be had. When God selected that the Levites be the priests, he didn't say, you, you're just a much more holy than all the other tribes. Right? Why did God select the Levites to be priests? Well, because he did, right? That was his choice, fundamentally. So, so we're not arguing the command here isn't, well, wives should submit because, 
because husbands are so superior to their wives. Are, so, so now I'll get to it. Are there any exceptions? People ask that, but I didn't want to get to it right away. Of course there's exceptions. Of course there's exceptions. If, if the husband asks you to sin. I mean, that's, that's clear, isn't it, from the rest of Scripture. You ought, you ought not to participate in sin. There have been occasions where husbands have asked wives to cheat financially. There have been occasions where husbands have asked wives to be unfaithful sexually. It's happened. Uh, well, of course, you don't obey commands like that. But the inclination of the heart, 1 Peter 3, even if your husband's an unbeliever, is to follow their leadership. That doesn't mean, by the way, I, I want to add this from 1 Peter 3, that doesn't mean that if a husband says, don't worship Christ, of course, that you follow them there. Uh, in, in the culture of that day, I think Plutarch, if I'm remembering right, a Roman writer said that the wife in all things should follow the religion of her husband. But Peter doesn't agree, does he? Clearly, he doesn't agree. That was countercultural. Now, the wife follows the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that means if the husband, in most cases, if the husband says to the wife, don't go to church, that you don't obey that. Because your allegiance is to Christ first. So, so yeah, there are exceptions. But the inclination of your heart is to submit to the husband. And God gives this command, as he gives all commands, for your good. So, so, so for your happiness and holiness, he doesn't, give, he doesn't give commands to oppress us, does he? He gives commands to, to strengthen us. Well, we could talk about this a lot longer, couldn't we? But we need to, we need to march on given all that we have to do. Well, let me just say another word. Of, of course, this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that wives don't have significant gifts to add to, to the relationship. I mean, we can read Proverbs 31. You know, the wife is buying property and involved in business and, and making a number of significant decisions. But, but maybe I'll say more about this when we come to husbands. So now, now to husbands, verse 25. Husbands, husbands are the head, right? We already saw that. We don't have to be made the head. Husbands are the head. It's just, it's just a fact, isn't it? When, when families fall apart, when families fall apart and there's not fathers, this has been demonstrated over and over again, hasn't it, in studies, then, 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 then the children are in utter disarray. It, there, there, you know, we have pockets of culture in our, in, in our country, and it's growing, isn't it? Where more and more we have fatherless families. And, 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 and if you're in that situation, you know, God may show mercy and strengthen you as a single mother. You know, that's a very tough situation to be in. And, and, and you can hold the family together. But typically, we're just looking at it generally, it's very hard to hold things down, isn't it? If the, if the father is not leading in a right way. In other words, fathers are heads, whether they like it or not. And, and, and as heads, verse 25, we're called upon to love, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I am struck again and again in reading the New Testament that typically... Typically, the New Testament doesn't call upon us to observe the law. Although that's a good thing, but it's more than that, isn't it? The paradigm for husbands is the self-sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It's so much more than merely fulfilling, you know, a list of responsibilities. It's, it's, it's patterned after Christ's love for the church in which he loved us and gave himself for the church of Jesus Christ. That's the paradigm for husbands. It's that kind of sacrificial love. Now, let's notice verse 26. Christ did this that he might sanctify the church, set the church apart, make it holy, having cleansed her, 
by the washing of water, I think that refers to baptism because everybody in the first century was a Baptist, right? <laughs> so this happened at conversion. No arguments about baptism in those days. So the washing of water symbolized your baptism because only believers were baptized, right? So he cleansed the church, speaking of your conversion, by the washing of water, symbolizing the cleansing blood of Christ in baptism. With the word, I take it the word there is the word of the gospel, that word that declares us to be clean and new before God. So we're cleansed by the washing of water at baptism, which God declares you're clean. You're new. You're washed. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor. When's that presentation going to take place? Last day. I don't have time to defend this, but I think this is an end time presentation. Yes, there is, there is a sanctification. We're washed now, we're cleansed. But, but I think he's speaking of the final sanctification in verse 27. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So that's the end time presentation where the church is perfect. It's like the, a bride coming up on the day of her wedding, right? Utterly beautiful. Utterly without blemish. Perfect. And, and this, is, this is what will be the case for all of us who are part of the church of Jesus Christ. Our, the church right now, it has some spots and wrinkles, doesn't it? And we have some spots and wrinkles too. But those are all going to be removed. And the church will be perfect. That she might be holy and without blemish. Now, you know, Paul was talking about husbands, <laughs> wasn't he? But, but husbands don't do this, do we? We don't sanctify our wives. Hold on, I'm going to apply this to husbands in a moment. But only Christ does that. We don't, we don't forgive our wives' sins. We don't wash her with the water of the word of the gospel. Not in the full sense he's talking about here. We don't present our wives as holy and blameless to God on the last day. That's a misreading of this text, isn't it? No, no, we don't do that. He, because remember, Paul's especially saying this is especially about Christ and the church. So there's some continuity there, but there's some discontinuity too. It could end up being a little bit of a weird relationship if husbands begin to take this seriously about themselves and their relationship to their wives. It could become a little bit strange, maybe a lot strange. So, so this is uniquely true to, of Christ, yet, yet there is a truth for husbands here, and that is we love our wives, don't we? We love our wives and in such a way that we're always thinking of how to advance their holiness and their, their walk with God. We, we, don't, we don't sanctify them finally, but we're praying and strategizing and thinking about how can we build our wives up so that they're holy and pure and godly. We can't make them that way, but God can use us to help in that endeavor. So I think there's continuity and discontinuity when we think of applying this text. And as he says in verse 28, in the same way, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. Because we're one flesh now, right? So we should love our wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, just as the church I remember as a Christ body, so husbands and wives were, were united. As the next verse says in Genesis, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So what it means to love our wives is to, is to love ourselves. Now, husbands, we know this, don't we? I know this. If I'm living in a way that's making my wife, Diane, unhappy, even if I think I'm right in my sinfulness, right? Even if I think I'm right, but she's not happy, guess what? I'm not happy 
<laughs> it works that way, doesn't it? I can pretend to be happy. I can even try to tell myself sometimes, I'm happy, it's okay. <laughs> but I'm not happy because we're bound together now. And if Diane's not happy and I'm responsible partially for her unhappiness, I'm not happy. That's what Paul's saying here. I've experienced this so many times. I've sinned against Diane and I'm unhappy. <laughs> I wanna be happy. That's what Paul's saying, right? In loving my wife, I'm really loving myself. We're, we're bound together here. So this, this alone doesn't convince us, does it, to, to follow the Lord. We need the power of the Spirit to do this. But here's a good motivation. Here's a good motivation. In loving our wives, we love ourselves. So we want to think about how our wives can flourish, and we want to study our wives. We want to study our wives and understand them so that, so that they'll flourish and prosper, and every wife is different. You know, I just thought, I'll give you a, kind of a, maybe a silly illustration, but you know, I just read things about women, and I, can, I thought they were all the same, you know? I read the books, and what wives want are presents. <laughs> like candy and flowers. But I married a wife, she doesn't like those things. Particularly, she, her, the way I show love for her is cleaning the bathroom, <laughs> right? It's a little different. Wives are different, so you have to study your wife. So, right. Male leadership doesn't mean, does it? It doesn't mean that we say as husbands, I never do diapers. I never do any service. I, I, that, there, that, there's a, that there are different tasks in the home, surely. And that one would concentrate more on one and one on the other, I agree. I agree with that and that's how it works out. But I, what I'm talking about here is husbands who say, well, I never help. That's, uh, that's all her job. Well, just think, part of what it means to love is to serve, right? It's, yes, it's leading, it's leading, but it's also serving. Well, maybe I should say a word about leading as well. Men, men can lead tyrannically. That's one way to lead. One way to lead is by being uh, a tyrant and just make, giving commands. That, that's an abuse that men can fall into. And of course, that can manifest itself even in physical abuse, can't it? But I think more typically, more often, most men tend to fall into passivity. Uh, you know, abuse, tyrannical actions, that can take place, but passivity. So that, so that they begin to leave the, the leadership of the home, especially the spiritual leadership of the home, to the wife. So, but, but God calls upon you as a husband. That doesn't mean you actually ne necessarily know the Bible better, does not necessarily? The wife may be smarter, but you're called upon as a husband to lead the home in seeking God, in prayer, making sure scripture reading's being done, making sure that you have spiritual conversations in the home, not artificially, naturally. Weave it into all of life. Your kids will know instantly if it's artificial. <laughs> They'll pick it up, right? It won't work. But if it's naturally what you're thinking about, tell them what you're thinking about. Tell them what you're thinking about everything, all of life. Then they'll pick it up. That's part of what leadership is. You know, people say, I don't know, they say Ronald Reagan wasn't a, a, a genius. Certainly he wasn't the smartest person in his administration, but he was a leader. Whether you agreed with him politically or not, he was a leader. So we ought not to correlate leadership with intelligence. You can be a leader and not be the most intelligent. Of course, maybe you are, but I'm just saying, let's not think of an excuse why we wouldn't exercise leadership in the home. And as I said the other night, the most important leadership that you exercise as husbands is being happy in God. Nothing is more important than that. That will be caught because as I said a moment ago, your wives, your wife and your kids, they won't be, they won't be fooled. They know what's going on. Well, we, we have to run a long time is going, but let's just look at verse 33. 
Paul says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So I've said something about husbands loving their wives, but, but uh, let me say a word about wives respecting their husband. That is so fundamental and crucial, isn't it? That wives show respect and regard, especially in public settings, to your husband. Never tear him down in public. Build, build him up in public. There is a place, there is a place for, for a wife to reprove a husband, but you pick that right context and that's typically going to be alone. And then to say it in a spirit, a spirit of gentleness and kindness, but, but I've seen it done in public. And to do it in public, uh, to tear down your husband in, in public, the damage that is done in that situation is, is great. So, so remember this admonition. A part of what it means to be a godly wife is to show respect and honor to your husband. Well, there's so many other applications we could talk about, but let's talk about children and, parent, and parents. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. By the way, this is another argument for what Paul says about husbands and wives not being cultural, because people run to the slavery passage. But what about this one? <laughs> Is this cultural? Children obey your parents? I've actually heard some people say it is cultural. Well, what do you say? Sometimes people just lose their minds. I mean, clearly, children need parents, right? Oh, that is just fundamental. Of course, he, call, he calls here upon one of the commandments from the Decalogue. Obey your parents in the Lord. I, don't, I think in the Lord modifies the verb, not the noun. Uh, so, so I, because I've run across some, right when I was first a Christian, and this uh, fellow who I'd become a Christian with said, well, I don't have to obey my parents because they're not Christians. <laughs> but, but, the, but the prepositional phrase, I think, modifies the verb. Obey in the Lord your parents, you see? Not your parents in the Lord. No, obey in the Lord your parents. That is, in the realm of the things of the Lord. As, as those who are filled with the Spirit, children are called upon to obey their parents. For this is right. Paul appeals to what is right. Everyone in their right mind recognizes this is the way things should be. You don't have to give a long argument to defend it. It's pretty evident. Of course, there are bad parents out there. But, but that's not what Paul's attending to here. Most parents, most parents care about their children and want what's best for them, even if they're unbelievers. So children are called upon to obey. And then he cites the commandment, doesn't he? Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So, so for, for young children, of course, obeying, obeying parents means obeying them obeying them right away when they give instructions, right? So not, not to become, um, you know, I, I sinned as a parent and not always making my kids obey right away, but that's not good for kids, is it? We, we call upon them to obey instantly, immediately, for their good, because as they relate to parents, so they relate to God. As God is God is their authority, so parents are their authority. We live in a very anti-authoritarian culture. Paul tells us this is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. What does that mean? Some people think it means, well, Generally speaking, if children obey their parents, they'll live a long life. But I would like to suggest to you that that's not what Paul has in mind here. I think this, we have to read this in light of Paul's theology of the land. 
Paul's theology of the inheritance. What is the inheritance for Paul? The inheritance for Paul is our end time blessing. The inheritance in Israel, you with me? The inheritance in Israel was the land that they received. Where is that word inheritance used over and over again? It's the land they received under Joshua. But for Paul, that inheritance is now our heavenly inheritance. What does he say about Abraham in Romans 4.13? He was heir of, the, of Canaan, of the world, of the new creation that's coming. So I would suggest to you that what Paul is saying here is children obey and honor your parents so that you'll enter the new creation. That's how it's going to go well with you. No promise of long life in this world. No promise of that. You'll live long in the land forever. Now, objection. Is that what? Obey to enter the new creation? That sounds like salvation by works, doesn't it? Wait a minute. I thought we were saved by grace. Children obey their parents to gain the heavenly inheritance? Isn't that contrary to Paul's gospel? Well, clearly Paul's already taught in Ephesians, hasn't he? Uh, chapter 2 Verses 8 and 9, very familiar verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Verse 10, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I don't have time to develop this in, in, in depth, but the good works, I think, are the fruit of, the necessary fruit of our new life in Christ. They're not the basis, right? That, that's a false gospel. They're not the basis of our right standing with God. I don't think that's what Paul means here, but they're a necessary consequence of our new life. Not perfection, but a necessary consequence of our new life in Christ. And that's what he's speaking of here. A child's obedience a child's obedience is an indication that they have new life in Christ. Well, we hurry on. Fathers, not mothers, fathers, chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers have a particular responsibility, don't they? Mothers have a responsibility as well, but fathers have a particular responsibility as, a, as the head in raising children. So fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So fathers, we have a special responsibility to see to it that our children are being instructed in the things of God. That doesn't mean we have to do all the instructing. But we are to see to it that our children are being brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now that's something we, we, we concentrate on in raising our children. I'm just going to say a word about something I've learned as being a pastor over the years. I, even before I was serving as a pastor, that is not the primary responsibility of the church. It's your responsibility. The church can help. Praise the Lord. But I have met a number of believers over the years, and they expect the church to educate their children in the things of God. Look, the church is the icing on the cake, and it's good. But it's your job to do it, and they're going to catch it from you. They're going to catch it from you fundamentally, and what you're like that's why it's so important, your own life in the home. They're going to catch it from you. I'm not saying all kids raised in Christian homes will be saved. I'm not saying that. I don't think that we have a promise. But I think normally, I take Proverbs 22, 6 to be what usually happens. Train up a child in the way they should go. I, I, I hold the traditional interpretation there. And, they will, and when they're old, they're not, they won't depart from it. Proverbs are not promises, but there are principles, right? And the principle is you train up a child in the way they should go. And normally, usually, they're not going to depart from the, and I think he's speaking there of the way of God. That's normally how it works. And that's 
your responsibility and your privilege and your joy. Yeah, there's exceptions and they're heartaches, aren't they? Those exceptions are heartaches. That doesn't mean you've necessarily failed, right? That doesn't mean that. But normally, normally they're gonna catch what you teach and preach and live. They're normally gonna catch that. I, I say that because the, the exceptions are out there. And as I said, that doesn't mean you've failed, but the exceptions can cause us not to pay attention to what is normally the case. And I want parents, as I think the scriptures say, to be optimistic. You, can, you have every reason to be optimistic. Like the world is hard, isn't it? But we can be full of optimism that our kids will follow in the ways of the Lord. It's not a promise, but we have every reason for optimism as we pray. So that's not the church's responsibility, it's yours. And the church helps. So don't, don't, don't think, that, don't, don't stake your children's future on the, on the church. Although the church can help, surely, as I said. And then he mentions, don't provoke your children to anger. Children need discipline, don't they? I'm reminded of that with our six grandchildren. They're great. They're little savages. You know? All kids are. They need to be domesticated, don't they? You know? It's true. Have, a, have an undisciplined child come into your house who's never been disciplined. And you may be very nice while they're there, but when they leave, what do you say to your spouse? <sighs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> they're gone. So, because it's like a storm just went through, right? Well, of course, kids are at different stages and they have different energy levels, don't they? I mean, our grandkids are different. Some are more energetic than others. And they need lots and lots of correction, don't they? They need lots of correction. That's the way God intended it. And that's what we need to do as parents. And that's exhausting. It's exhausting because a lot of times we're tired and we just want to let them go because we're just tired out. But they need it. So we need lots and lots of instruction. That's, that's part of what it means to be a parent. But Paul says, watch out for something here. Watch out that you don't overdo it. You can underdo it. So it takes wisdom, right? It's wisdom. You can underdo it, but you can overdo it. And you can exasperate them. You can begin to demand perfection of your kids. You can forget you're a sinner yourself. And you can begin to demand unrealistic things from, from children and, and have a kind of perfectionism that begins to humiliate them and discourage them and, and depress them. So he says, watch out. And, and, and don't you recognize when we come to a text like this, there, there's just no formula, is there? Life's not a formula. It takes great spiritual wisdom. There, it, there's not ni some nice little rule book here. We're given general directives, but we need the wisdom of the Spirit. We, we, we need help. How do, how do I work this out? I need to discipline them, but not too much. What does that look like? Where's the 10 rules? There aren't 10 rules. We need wisdom. We, we need others to help us. We, uh, and, and, of course, we, we have classes in our church on raising children, but there's, we, we need the community, the church, as well. All kinds of things here. Well, so many things to talk about here, and uh, Dr. Ware told me that he didn't mind if I took his hour, so <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> but I, I want to say something about this last paragraph very quickly, so... Of chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there, there is no partiality with him. So I already spoke about slavery in, in, in general terms, and I think it is legitimate to apply this to employers and employees in our context today. I think that's a legitimate application of the passage, although that's not directly what Paul is talking about here. 
Of course, employees aren't slaves, are they? So there's discontinuity. Uh, and, and employers aren't masters, although sometimes it can feel that way. But it isn't, the, the, the parallel isn't exactly there. But, but what does Paul say really to both of them? Do your work before God, right? Whether, whether, you're, whether you're the employer or the employee, you're fundamentally in your work, you're, you're fundamentally not there if you're an employee to please your boss. You're fundamentally there to please God. So you don't work with eye service. My, my dad was a nurseryman. He grew, he grew iris outside of Salem, Oregon. Every summer we would hire 50 to 100 uh, high school and college students. So I grew up, I have seven brothers and sisters. I grew up working in those fields with the others. And, and my dad was a very strict boss which was a good thing. And so when he'd come down those dusty dirt roads with his pickup, a lot of the workers would look up and they'd start working faster. <laughs> that was working with eye service, right? Here comes the boss. Let's, let's put in a little double time now. That's what Paul's speaking against, isn't he? That we are to work as to the Lord, to, to please him in what we're doing. And masters, he says, need to beware of a kind of arrogant use of authority where they threaten their workers as if they're not fully human. So let me just think of, in the time we have left, a couple applications. First of all, I want to recommend a book by, maybe some of you have read it, by Matt Perman called What's Next Best? I can hardly say that book but by Matt Perman, it's about work from a Christian perspective, and it's called What's Next Best? What's Next Best by Matt Perman. Um, just, just a couple of things here for employers. I, don't, I think we could say it's not right for an employer to fire someone at the end of their career simply because they're making a higher salary and they want to lower the payroll because employers also have to think of what's just and right. And that's not fair and right to do that to a faithful employee simply as, as they're getting older and uh, are, 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 are more of a burden upon the company. So, so it isn't right, is it, only to think of, certainly employers have to think of the bottom line, but it isn't right only to think of that. That's not the only consideration we recognize the many virtues of the capitalistic system, but we don't endorse it in every respect. We also have to consider what's right and just and good. In terms of, in terms of employees, we, our fundamental role is to serve, serve God and to serve others in, in the work we do. And, and in terms of work, this is something that Matt Perman said that spoke to me. I have sometimes thought, you know, I'm really working well if I'm the most efficient. You know, I, I already mentioned something about my dad, very Germanic in his work ethic, and I gleaned, I think, a lot of benefits from that. But there's a, there's a liability to that as well. So on the one hand, maybe I should say to you who aren't so efficient and don't work very hard, God calls you to work hard. Right? You're, you're, you're called to labor and to work hard and do your work well because many people in our culture don't. But then on the other side, I say to someone like me, some of you are wired like me, I can confuse efficiency always with pleasing God. But sometimes God wants me to stop and have a conversation with a person, right? Whereas I think, well, I checked off the 10 things I was supposed to do today. So God must be happy. But, but, perhaps, but, but perhaps part of what I was called to do wasn't the most efficient thing. So I, I would just simply call upon us to think Christianly about these things. Again, that there's, no, there's no rule here, is there? The, the rule is we serve Christ and we serve others in our work. But what does that look like? Let's, let's take that through the lenses of the whole counsel of God. And that's why I recommend Matt Perman's book, at least if you haven't read that book, to kind of get the conversation started of what it means to please God in our work. Well, I'm out of time.
Thank you for your patience. Let's uh, pray together and we'll look forward to uh, Dr. Ware's message momentarily. Uh, Father, we, we've just talked about so many things and I am just so conscious of the fact that we've just skimmed the surface and uh, Lord, I just pray that anything I said here that uh, is not helpful or is misunderstood in some way, that it would be balanced out by other parts of Scripture. Lord, help us, Lord, to be the husbands and, and wives and, and, and children and parents and employees and employers that you've called us to be. Let, may we recognize that every dimension of our life has lived under your lordship that you are the king of all that we do. And we do, Lord, we want to please you and we need, we need your wisdom and we need your strength. So, so guide us, Lord. May we be lights in the world in the way we parent and in the way we act as uh, children and in the way we work, Lord. Help us, we pray, in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.